Nigeria's electoral body says it's ready for the March 28th presidential election following a delay because of security concerns. New York is enticing designers and manufacturers to bring their business back to the city. We'll explain. And an enthusiastic sign language interpreter steals the spotlight from Eurovision hopefuls. Africa 54 starts right now. Good evening, I'm Vincent McCorry. This is Africa 54. Now we'll have more on those stories in a moment. But we begin in North Africa where a deadly standoff at Tunisia's top museum has ended with at least 19 people killed. Tunisia's prime minister says 19 people, including tourists, were killed Wednesday when gunmen targeted visitors to the country's Bardo Museum. Two of the gunmen were also killed when security forces moved in to end the standoff. Among the dead are 17 tourists from Poland, Italy, Germany and Spain. Two members of the security forces were also killed during the operation, according to Prime Minister Habib Hasid. At least 24 others were injured in the attack near Parliament. It remains unclear who the gunmen were. Tunisian television showed images of older tourists and children fleeing the scene under the cover of armed security forces. Tunisia's Minister of Justice, judges and several army officials were inside the Parliament building during a session on the country's anti-terrorism law. Tunisian Prime Minister Beji Saeed Essebsi is expected to address the country about the attacks later in the day. For continuing coverage of the attack in Tunisia, visit voanews.com. While well, Nigerians head to the polls on March the 28th, the nation's independent and national electoral commission says it's ready to conduct the presidential parliamentary elections after the vote was delayed by six weeks over security concerns. For the voters, especially the young, their only hope is that this time around, whoever wins will act on their promises. Awoloa is a taxi town finding passengers for the motorized rickshaws that throng the streets of Lagos. He left school at the age of 10 and now earns just a few dollars a day. As presidential elections loom, he'd like to see his country offer a better future for young people. There is scarcity of work on the road. People applying academic, you see, you see a old mastering degree holder that is riding bike on the road. We have a scarcity of economy, scarcity of everything in Nigeria. At a hairdressing salon in a working class area of the city, Perpetua is also concerned about the situation. Only 20 years old, she's already tired of the promises made at election time. What matters for her is security and education. Our Chibo girls is, are not yet back, so I don't know what government are still doing about that. As I can hear from their campaign, they said um, if we can vote for Buhari, that they will give us um, they will bring back the cheapest girls. So we don't know what they're doing about that now. So if they can work on it, especially in education level also, will give us a sound education, make um, social amenities for us, we can go for them. Nigeria might well be Africa's leading economy and the continent's biggest oil producer, but more than 35% of people under age 25 are underemployed. That devastating figure has created a mistrust of politicians who are regularly embroiled in corruption scandals. What some people are saying, are arguing, is that if we can vote out the ruling government this time around, politicians, will, especially since it's an incumbent, politicians will begin to understand that the answer to us. So there's, there's that divergence of, of opinions. Some believe that there's no point, while some believe that we should be patient and keep trying until we get it right. In less than two weeks, Nigeria's young voters will have to choose their next president. The incumbent, good luck Jonathan, is up against a former military ruler, Muhammadu Buhari. Both men have based their campaign around the young in a country where 43% of the population is under 15. Now for further discussion on the upcoming presidential election, I'm joined by Emmanuel Ogebe, an international human rights lawyer and expert in bilateral U.S.-Nigerian relations. Also with us today, Kadir Hassan, a consultant and analyst on Nigerian affairs. Gentlemen, welcome to Africa 54. Thank you very much. And so very the election much. is uh, very close and uh, many people are looking at the two important men right now. 
uh, incumbent, President uh, Jonathan, and of course the opposition, uh, General Buhari. If I may begin with you, uh, uh, Hassan. First, why do you think Nigerians would want to vote for General Buhari, who was formerly a military ruler in Nigeria? Well, um, I think the situation in the country says it all, this cocard is out. Um, Nigeria in the last five, six years had more oil revenues than ever in its history, but unemployment rates are up, uh, insecurity is so high, the Naira has crashed. The economy is not working for the population, mm -hmm. most of the people. Yeah. And I think um, the ruling party has been there for 16 years and uh, Nigerians want to try something new. <laughs> and you know, Emmanuel, a few weeks ago, uh, there were projections that uh, the incumbent president, uh, good like Jonathan, was uh, looking like he's going to win, at least to perhaps have a narrow uh, victory. But uh, there were some studies conducted by uh, some group called uh, EuroAsia Group. It says that actually it looks like the tide is turning against uh, Jonathan, that actually Buhari stands a good chance. Do you believe that? Well, actually, I, I disagree with both uh, assessments because a few weeks ago I was on ground in Nigeria and the impression then was that President Goodluck would likely lose or that there would be a, a constitutional tie because they would not have been able to conduct elections in the Northeast and they wouldn't meet the constitutional thre threshold mm -hmm. of votes. So now that the military has liberated uh, two of the three states, in the Northeast that were taken by terrorists, there's a greater propensity that elections will be held in all of those regions. And the public is beginning to feel, if this man could change in six weeks to fight the terrorists, maybe we should give him a chance. So I think that I disagree with those uh, <laughs> So Hassan, uh, you know, basing it actually on what has been achieved lately, and that's what the president, uh, Gulak, is saying that, you know, look, we have secured, we have literally secured in the North and Northeast. Isn't that evidence that he can do much more once well, he gets an next mandate? Well, the thing mandate? is, um, is uh, an indictment on the president because he himself, he said he underestimated the situation. Mm -hmm. This uh, problem did not start um, in six weeks' time. It has been there, and uh, everybody knew that uh, what needs to be done in terms of mm -hmm. what the military needs to do and, uh, and the challenges before it, but he, they, they he just literally it. took his eye off the ball yeah. until when the elections clearly showed that he's going to lose, mm -hmm. then he went back to work. And you uh, know, Emmanuel, I, that's what is the argument. Uh, I think some are saying, why didn't he do what he has done in the last three weeks or so? Mm -hmm. uh, the unemployment, as we saw in, in my report earlier, is still high, or many of the young people are severely underemployed. Mm -hmm. What is there for Mr. Jonathan to show for his five years and actually more than five years yes. in power? I mean, very candidly, any president who has done four or five years and is going up for re-election and is having a hard time, it means that he did something wrong that made it difficult for him to be elected. But when you compare that with General Buhari, who was in power for 20 months he, under a military dictatorship and even his own military felt he was too bad that they kicked him out. If you compare those two, it's difficult to say that we have uh, a good option. But the fact of the matter is, this president is a minority. This is the first time we're having a minority in that office. So clearly, uh, he doesn't have as much of a strong base as he would have had if he was from a majority tribe. And so it's taking him a lot of time to survive even the uh, you know, minority tribal uh, ethnic battles. And I think that this turn around uh, might encourage some people that there's hope. I don't, I don't fully endorse what he has done before, but I think it, it's indicative that he's learning his a lesson. Now, uh, looking back, you know, going back to Buhari's time. I think, yes. First of all, I think the issue is not that Pre uh, President Jonathan is a minority. He won the 2011 election, okay, by the goodwill of Nigerians from across the geopolitical zones. He won from everywhere. He, he got support from the north, from the southwest, from everywhere, yes. and he won by a margin of more than 10 million votes because people thought he would deliver. So the issue of minority, tribes, religion, it's not the issue. It's the issue is that Jonathan failed Nigerians in terms of security, in terms of economy, 
in terms of unemployment of the youth. These three things mm -hmm. are what Nigerians are looking at. Now, and to kind of uh, take them off the table and say because he's minority, he cannot build his support base. No. Well, I, 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 what's I, your, what's your, what's your I argument against that? I disagree with that because yeah. the bottom line is when he won in 2011, in 12 states, in the 12 Sharia states of the north, they went on rampage and killed uh, hundreds of people, destroyed over 700 churches. How is that a sign of support? And, and actually, <laughs> Hassan, there are some who have accused Buhari of being an extremist. He, has, uh, he himself said that he would restore that's, that's, stricter that's the Sharia issue. laws. He in won North. in Adamawa State. He won in Benue. He won in Nasarawa. Mm -hmm. They are all. How about if he base uh, his uh, future on the past? Even in Kazina, he won almost mm. 30 to 40 percent of the votes in yeah. Kazina, Buhari's hometown. Yeah. What I'm saying is that Jonathan in 2011 had the support of Nigerians strongly, okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a lot of hope that he will deliver with the oil prices mm -hmm. at all-time high in the history of OPEC. But okay, can so history... He, he did not deliver. Can, can, uh, and that's the problem. You don't want to judge him as a minority. You yeah. want to judge, judge him on him his record. As a Nigerian. On his record. I, yes. And, and uh, uh, Emmanuel, yes. What, what do you say? I mean, the fact is that actually he got the support of many Nigerians he, in the past. He got the support of many Nigerians. And he's a minority president the same way that President Barack of Obama is a minority president. But he had the support and goodwill of a lot of black people, but did a lot of white people. But he squandered the goodwill. Did he squander the, the, the goodwill? I feel there's no doubt that yeah. he did squander the goodwill. Yes. I, I, there's no the doubt point, about yeah. it. The fact so that, of the does matter, he deserve then to be rewarded? Well, here's the, the fact <laughs> of the matter. The fact of the matter is this, that there's nothing I have seen that Buhari has done from when he left power over 30 years ago till now uh, in that makes seconds, him justified Definitely. Uh, to replace him. <laughs> Definitely. As a, he headed... They are trying to run Shoa P. Yeah, they yeah. cannot, the PDP. Yeah. The Shoa P thing was something similar to PTF, yeah. which Buhari ran effectively. It has been under investigation by the PTF government by, for okay. 16 years. No indictment. You know what? We'll, ran... continue. we'll continue this discussion. Thank Thanks you. a lot, uh, gentlemen, uh, for, for your perspectives Thank today. Uh, 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 well, Mr. Mwenel Ogebe is an international human rights lawyer and also an expert in bilateral U.S. and Nigerian relations. And Kadir Hassan is an analyst of Nigerian issues, and we thank you very much for joining us today. Well, now, there are signs that efforts by the United States and other coalition countries are taking their toll on the Islamic State militant group. While well, still officials and analysts caution the extremist organization is far from falling apart. VOA National Security correspondent Jeff Seldin tells us more. For Iraqis praying for the defeat of the Islamic State, celebrations like these are a welcome sign. Welcome. Yet as the fighting rages on, terrorism experts such as J.M. Berger caution against excessive optimism. I think it's too early to say that the pendulum is swinging. What's really critical for their legitimacy purposes is going to be to hold Mosul and Raqqa. I think they can take a lot of losses uh, up to those two cities before their legitimacy starts to really suffer. Berger and other analysts say while the Islamic State may be fraying along the edges, none of the defeats inflicted by Iraqi and Kurdish forces or Shia militias have been close to striking a fatal blow. Talk of dissent within the group's ranks, even executions of would-be Islamic State defectors, may also be overblown. So the fact that they are executing internal dissidents is, in my opinion, not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of this is a totalitarian regime, and that's how they govern. Christopher Harmer at the Institute for the Study of War says even getting the Islamic State on the run isn't necessarily an advantage. Where they have the best competitive advantage is in exploding IEDs, suicide vests, suicide bombers, uh, vehicular IEDs, all these things that gave the American war machine so much trouble uh, in Iraq, that's going to be nearly impossible for the Peshmerga and the Iraqi security forces to overcome. For now, top U.S. intelligence officials are wary of writing any epitaphs. CIA Director John Brennan. Well, I do think we're seeing right now some very significant uh, indicators that ISIL's engine is suffering. Uh, that doesn't mean that it's out of steam. The fear? The more the Islamic State gets backed into a corner, the bloodier and more dangerous it will get. Jeff Selden, VOA News, Washington.
Well, we want to know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover. Join the conversation on Facebook. The address is Africa 54 and check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. While well, coming up, New York offers parks to keep the garment industry in the city. Stay with us. Nigeria heads to the polls March 28th for a landmark election. What happens there matters throughout Africa. Turn to Voice of America for the facts. VOA reporters are in Nigeria and surrounding countries covering the campaigns and the issues and counting down to the March 28th election and beyond. Special Nigeria Decides 2015 coverage is underway now. A commitment to Africa from Voice of America. Welcome back. U.S. First Lady Michelle Obama is in Japan for a three-day visit meant to highlight her Global Women's Education Initiative. Mrs. Obama landed late Wednesday in Tokyo. Thursday, she is set uh, to hold a separate meetings with Prime Minister Shinzo Abe and his wife, Aki. She also plans to meet with the Emperor and Empress of Japan before heading to the tourist hotspot, Kyoto. On Friday, the First Lady was unable to accompany President Obama on his trip to Japan last year. Uh, this trip is widely seen as making up for the, that absence. Mrs. Obama is also expected to announce a partnership between the U.S. and Japan on global left, uh, Let Girls Learn initiative. Well, many of the world's most uh, revered designers create their fashions in New York City. But often those designs are manufactured overseas to save money. Now, America's largest city is providing economic incentives to encourage more manufacturing in the city and to entice emerging designers to take root there. Uh, Daniela Schreier reports from New York's Garments District. In New York City, the fashion industry accounts for more than 5% of the workforce and generates nearly $18 billion a year in retail sales. Despite economic ups and downs, wholesalers, manufacturers, and designers have been doing business here in New York's garment district since the 1880s. Mayor Bill de Blasio says the industry is integral to the city. Not only a uh, functionally key sector of our economy, but one of the most iconic industries in this city, something so deeply uh, identified with the character and the personality of New York City. And we want to make sure it stays that way and, in fact, becomes stronger. This year, the city will allocate $15 million to encourage emerging designers and manufacturers to create fashions locally through a program called Made in New York. Eligible companies like Leota must sell at least 1,000 products annually and design, cut, sew, assemble, and finish their fashions in the city. So what sample are we cutting here? Founder Sarah Carson is looking forward to additional Made in New York production incentives. And getting that financing as a small business, as a growing business, is really key to expanding um, my business here, creating more jobs right here in New York, and fueling the growth in the garment industry and in the fashion business in New York. Leota was launched in New York four years ago and has steadily grown. But manufacturing in New York has limitations. Sky-high rents, an aging yeah. workforce, and outdated technology. We lack some of the technology that we need to do the complicated knitting techniques and laser cutting and some of the popular styles that that the people are buying right now, you can't make them here. The Made in New York program provides incentives to factories that invest in technology and workforce development. So far, the city has granted more than a million dollars to eligible factories. Kenny Huang owns a local factory where Leota designs are manufactured. It's a family business he runs with his wife, Carmen. He says there is not enough consistent fashion manufacturing work to keep his seamstresses busy year-round. To help fix that, 
the city created an electronic platform connecting local designers with local production facilities. Hopefully, that means more businesses for factories and skilled workers. Plus, if Wong invests in technology upgrades, he could qualify for cash incentives that would position his factory as an even more attractive option for New York-based designers. From design to manufacturing to final product, this dress is 100% made in New York. That's good for the local economy, and it also ensures that New York will be a fashion capital for years to come. Daniela Schreier, VOA News, New York. Well, it's time now for a short break. Still to come on Africa 54, a man who really loves his job becomes an online sensation. We'll be right back. If you've just joined us, I'm Mariama Diallo, and here is a quick recap of today's headlines. In Tunisia, gunmen kill at least eight people and take other visitors hostage in a museum near the parliament building. In Lesotho, the country holds a swearing-in ceremony for newly elected Prime Minister Pakalfa Mosisili. In Senegal, President Macky Sall announces his plans of a referendum in 2016 to reduce his mandate to bring about earlier presidential elections. Finally, Ugandan banana producers against a controversial bill regulating genetically modified produce. That's it for today. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Welcome back to Africa 54. Here's what's trending on Wednesday. A sign language translator finds internet fame after avatars of performers. While Tommy Krang was on hand to sign lyrics of a song performed on a televised Eurovision singing competition, here he is enthusiastically signing and dancing to a performance by singer Magnus Carlsen as it played on a screen behind him. A post on Reddit took to, uh, to the YouTube video to viral status and turned crying into a celebrity. He told a Swedish newspaper, it's crazy and I'm very happy for all the nice words. I have really been love bombed. Well, next up, a pop star Rihanna has a new gig. Representing Christian Dio, the restored French fashion house says the 27-year-old Rihanna will appear in an upcoming video and print ad campaign as the company's first black model to front one of its campaigns. A spokeswoman for Dio would not comment further on Rihanna's new involvement with the company. Uh, the bold uh, Barbados-born Rihanna is a regular at fashion shows from New York to Paris. Well, and finally, Facebook is clarifying its rules. Well, the social media giant is telling its users exactly what they can and cannot post. On the no list, uh, self-injury, dangerous organizations, uh, bullying and harassment, uh, criminal activities, sexual violence and exploitation. The clarification comes as Facebook sees an increase in government requests for account data. It also disclosed information about content removal. Facebook says in the second half of 2014, it restricted close to 10,000 pieces of content for violating local laws. Uh, that is 11% more than in the first half of the year. And that is what is trending today. Now, the fifth leg of the World Volvo Ocean Race is now underway after a delay of three days to escape the powerful winds of Cyclone Pam. The nine-month global race was scheduled to leave New Zealand uh, for Brazil on Sunday. At present, the Abu Dhabi Ocean Racing Team leads the way, followed by China's uh, Dongfeng Race Team. The Dongfeng team led for most of the four leg, or rather most of leg four. Here's VOS Caroline Turner with leg four highlights. The Dongfeng race team has dominated the Volvo Ocean race since they entered their home waters in Sanya, China. 
They became the first Chinese team ever to win a leg in the Volvo Ocean Race history while also taking the overall lead. What we have trained last year, we did already the half of his leg, so they know what, what they are going to fight against and uh, we are ready for that. For sure, we, uh, the China Sea is famous to be a very bad sea state and uh, the main goal is not to break the boat during these first three days. The race's all-female team, SCA, say they are up to the challenge. Um, well, this leg's going to be a little bit tougher start, I think, for everybody, because we're starting here in Sanya and then going straight out and took some quite strong headwinds. On February 8th, after an import race to entertain the crowds, the fleet departed Sanya and raced out to sea to begin Lake 4 to New Zealand just over 5,200 nautical miles and is among the toughest sea conditions the fleet will encounter. Huge waves and furious winds in excess of 25 knots battered and bruised the fleet as it sailed upwind through the South China Sea towards the Pacific Ocean. There's lots of water on the deck. You can see everything is moving. Difficult to sleep. The Dong Fen team lost their lead when repairs were required to fix its mast track, which had broken free from the mainsail. We broke uh, the G1 uh, locking system, and one of the parts of the locking system of the G1 Alliard. And uh, it seems that the G1 Alliard is inside the mast, so we cannot get uh, the Alliard back uh, to use it. They made temporary fixes, but will need to reach lighter winds to make permanent repairs. The fleet separated as Team SCA and Team Brunel pushed north to catch more wind. They chose a fast lane route that requires they sail 300 nautical miles longer than their rivals. Team Alva Medica says they paid a price for sticking with the pack. Now uh, is where you start to see the reward for the northerly option. Brunel's already well ahead of us and uh, probably ahead of Abu Dhabi and SCA is about four miles ahead of us. Team Brunel in Abu Dhabi maintained the lead. Well, we're just sort of hooked into the trades now, so we're northeasterly winds. Um, we're leading the pack. And then the breakaway two in the north, uh, Brunel and uh, SCA, basically now have got the hammer down and they're going to start to use their leverage to, to get over the top of us. With still a long way to go on the treacherous race, things change daily. Spanish entry Mapfre won a tight duel with Abu Dhabi to capture the fourth leg of the race into Auckland, New Zealand. Leg five around the Cape Horn is set for March 15th. Carolyn Turner, VOA News. Well, as we mentioned at the top of the piece, a cyclone Pam delayed the start of leg five, which is now underway on Wednesday. And that's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. For more news, tune in to VOA's evening radio show, African News Tonight, at 1800 UTC. And in the mornings to daybreak Africa between 0300 and 0600 UTC, Monday through Friday. Thanks a lot for watching from all of us here in Washington. Have a good night. Music is something that brings people together. Music educates, it motivates, it's a bridge. Music Alley on VOA. I am Sheikha Sali, host and senior editor of VOA's international calling talk show, Straight Talk Africa. The issues that we discuss are pertinent to most people on the African continent.